Hey everybody, Q RuPaul here. Welcome to the third lesson of my Spanish course for beginners, from cero to conversational. I hope you're ready for an information-packed lesson today. In the first two lessons, you learned some great plug-and-play phrases, I also call them formulas, to express desire, ability, and obligation. Well, hopefully you've been practicing those. You'll definitely be using them a lot in your Spanish, especially today. Well, so far, we've only been talking about ourselves in this course, and that seems a bit self-centered, doesn't it? So in this lesson, we're going to be learning how to talk to someone else. In other words, to you, whoever you are. The goal of this course is to make you conversational, and in most conversations, there are at least two participants, I and you. Again, whoever you are. Well, in Spanish, we have two different ways to address someone as you. One is formal, and one is informal. The formal you in Spanish is usted, and the word formal probably gives you some idea who you would use this form with. Basically, anyone you might call sir or ma'am or want to show some level of respect to. The informal you is tú. It has a little accent over the you. This one is the more casual form of you. This is the one you're going to use with friends, neighbors, co-workers, acquaintances, or even with children. In some countries, you're going to hear the informal used a lot more than in some others, even with strangers sometimes. You're just going to have to get a feel for um, how the whole tú and usted thing is going to work wherever you're at. So you might be thinking, okay, Paul, so we have two yous, so I just need to, you know, I can just swap out a word here and there, just whichever one it is, either tú or usted. Uh, it's not going to be that easy. You see, tú and usted use completely different verb conjugations. They use different possessive pronouns and different direct and indirect object pronouns. And even if you don't know what all those grammatical terms mean, and you really don't need to right now, all you have to know is it's not as easy as just taking the word tú out and putting the word usted in. So the decision we have to make now is which you should we focus on at this point in the course? Well, I'm going to tell you we're going to focus on the informal, but we will eventually get around to the formal. Uh, that's probably going to pop in when I'm teaching you how to talk about third parties. The reason for that is that, grammatically speaking, usted and the uh, third person singular have a lot in common. You'll see what I mean when we get to that. But for now, all you have to know is we're going to be using the informal or the to form. You might be wondering why I chose to go the informal route first. Well, it really comes down to the fact that the to form is much easier to use for a variety of reasons. If you're curious what all those reasons are, stick around after the lesson at the end of the video and I'll go through them. But for now, we're just going to move on with the lesson. You're just going to have to take my word for it. All right? Okay, let's get started. Uh, today, we're still going to be working primarily with those verbs querer, to want, poder, to be able to, and tener, to have. Today, we're going to be adding the conjugations for those verbs in the to form. That's it for now. I don't want to confuse you with a lot of new verb conjugations because I want you to be able to think quickly so you can have a conversation. And for now, we're just going to be focusing on alternating between I, you, you, I. That's it. I'm going to go through these conjugations really quickly because we're really only learning three new words, so we don't spend a lot of time with it. But don't worry, you're going to have plenty of opportunities during the lesson to practice using them, so it'll reinforce them in your memory. Let's go ahead and start with querer, to want. You already know how to say I want. Yo quiero. Well, you want is tú quieres, quieres. You want to pronounce all of those vowels. Quieres, quieres. As you've already heard me say several times in this course, the tendency in Spanish is to leave off the subject and just keep the verb, for example, quieres instead of tú quieres, if it's clear from the conjugation of the verb or the context of the sentence or conversation who the subject is, who the verb belongs to. Well, I can tell you that one of the advantages of using tú is that it is always clear from the conjugation that that is who you're talking about. So, that means you can always leave it off. In other words, that's one less word you have to worry about sticking in your sentence when you're chatting. Here are some examples. Do you want to go to the park? ¿Quieres ir al parque? Sí. Quiero ir al parque. See how easy it is to create a dialogue with what you've already learned just by changing quiero, quieres, and alternating? Let's go on to poder, to be able to. You already know I can, right? Yo puedo. So, you can is tú 
puedes, puedes. This is not the easiest word for English speakers sometimes because it's kind of odd with that U there. It's kind of like a P-W-E-H, like pue, puedes. I know that if you've already gone through lessons one and two, that you should be able to already translate these two sentences. So go ahead and give it a try. Can you confirm the information? And yes, I can confirm the information. Ready? Can you confirm the information? Puedes confirmar la información? That's just your cognate tricks. You just popped in puedes, right? And of course, if you could do that one, you can do this one. Yes, I can confirm the information. Sí, puedo confirmar la información. This is a piece of cake, right? All right, let's move on to tener, to have. You already know I have, yo tengo, tengo. And you have is tú tienes, tienes. Really focus on those vowels. Tienes, tienes. Here's an example of that in a sentence. Do you have any children? Tienes hijos? Yes, I have two children. Si, sí, tengo dos hijos. Now, I've never taught you any numbers in this course so far. Um, I found that most English speakers, when they start to learn Spanish, already know one through 10 that they've picked up somewhere. And then they have to learn the numbers beyond that. I want you to know that I'm not going to have a lesson specifically covering numbers in Spanish. Why? Because it's absolutely everywhere. You can find videos about it on YouTube. You can find uh, websites. And it's just a matter of you sitting down and learning the numbers, which you will have to do at some point. Let's start to work in some new vocabulary. Here's a verb, hacer, hacer. The H is silent, remember? This means to do or to make. This is a must-learn word. There's a lot of vocabulary today, but this is one you really should write down and make an effort to learn. We're also going to start to learn how to make questions using our constructions. So, our first question of the day is... ¿Qué quieres hacer hoy? ¿Qué quieres hacer hoy? What do you want to do today? That is the question that is going to be starting the dialogue between you and me today. All right, just take a quick look at that. Our new question word is ¿Qué? You may have noticed it. I mentioned it in an earlier video, but I didn't really focus on it. So it's ¿Qué? with the accent over the E, and it means the question word what. The other word you may not have known is hoy, which means today. I'm sure you can already see how to start working que into what you've already learned. You can make sentences like, que quieres? What do you want? Que puedes hacer? What can you do? Que tienes que hacer hoy? What do you have to do today? So let's start our dialogue, okay? So back to our question. Que quieres hacer hoy? What do you want to do today? It's translation time. So translate this sentence. Do you want to go to the beach? Feel free to stop the video if you need to. Um, some of these you may be already getting quick enough that you can just spit them out. I'm going to say the English, pause a little bit, and then I'm going to give you the Spanish. Okay? Do you want to go to the beach? ¿Quieres ir a la playa? Yes, I want to go to the beach, but I can't. Sí, quiero ir a la playa, pero no puedo. If you had trouble with either one of those sentences, you really need to go back and review the first two lessons in the series, okay? Because each lesson builds on the ones before it, and if you're not getting the concepts, you're definitely going to fall behind really quickly, and then things are just going to seem confusing. So in a dialogue, we're up to the point that the person wants to go to the beach, but they can't. So what would you naturally ask someone? Well, why not? So how do we say why not? Well, first let's learn how to say why, and that's two words put together, por qué. And you'll see that's the K with a little accent on it. It almost means like, because of what? Literal translation, because of what? In English, we would just say why, por qué. Now, if we want to say why not, all we're going to do is put the word no after it. Por qué no? Why not? Por qué no? So we can just stick that into our conversation. We don't have to do much more with it. So we have si. Sí, Quiero ir a la playa, pero no puedo. ¿Por qué no? So now we have to be able to say, because something, right? Because I have something to do. Because is pretty easy to remember if you can remember why, because all they did was stick the two words together, take off the accent, and it's por qué. So you have why, por qué, and because, por qué, something. Let's say we say, because I have to work. I've never taught you the verb to work. It is trabajar, trabajar. 
So that's pretty easy to do because I have to work. Now that you can see the verb trabajar and I just taught you because, go ahead and translate that. Ready? Por qué tengo que trabajar? You're just plugging things into the formulas you already know. So at this point in the conversation, we can just give up talking to our friend or we can inquire further and ask them, well, when can you go to the beach? And that's going to bring us to our next question word, when. That's cuando. Cuando. So now that you know the word cuando, you shouldn't have any problem translating that sentence. All right. When can you go to the beach? ¿Cuándo puedes ir a la playa? Now, at this point in the conversation, we normally say some time we can go to the beach or some day, something like that. I'm going to have an entire lesson dedicated to times, dates, and days. But for now, let's just stick with a couple, okay? So you just learned hoy, today. Um, mañana is another good one to know. Tomorrow. And we're going to learn one more, and it's más tarde, which means later. So we have hoy, today, mañana, tomorrow, and más tarde, is later. With just that little bit of new vocabulary, see if you can translate this sentence. I can go to the beach tomorrow. I can go to the beach tomorrow. You got it? Puedo ir a la playa mañana. Puedo ir a la playa mañana. And you should be saying these out loud, right? Work on that pronunciation. All right, now let's put our entire conversation together to see how much of it you can actually translate on your own, all right? You'll definitely need to stop the video for this one. I really encourage you to write it out because that way you'll know if you got it right. Otherwise, I'll show it to you and you'll be like, oh yeah, uh, that's what I said. Yeah, just like that. So here's our entire conversation. What do you want to do today? Do you want to go to the beach? Yes, I want to go to the beach, but I can't. Why not? Because I have to work. Oh, when can you go to the beach? I can go to the beach tomorrow. Go ahead and stop because I'm not going to just pause for five minutes. It'd be kind of awkward. Probably won't even take you that long, actually, will it? All right, you ready? So what you wrote down should look like this. ¿Qué quieres hacer hoy? ¿Quieres ir a la playa? Sí. Quiero ir a la playa, pero no puedo. ¿Por qué no? Porque tengo que trabajar. ¿Cuándo puedes ir a la playa? Puedo ir a la playa mañana. Did you get it right? If you did, that's outstanding. If you had some trouble remembering some of the vocabulary here and there, that's understandable. Um, some of this is new just from today. But uh, as long as you're getting the general sentence structures down, you're doing a great job. All right. If you want to study on your own, I recommend using that same dialogue that I just showed you and simply plugging in other locations and then saying it out loud. Through that repetition, it's really going to drive home not only those constructions, but also new vocabulary. You can use some of the locations that I have on the screen here or look up new words using, uh, I recommend wordreference.com. Their website's great, so is their app. In this course, I'm not giving you long vocabulary lists of just nouns and verbs to learn that are kind of disjointed. What I'm doing is I'm teaching you how to create your own sentences to talk about anything you want. All you have to do is drop in a new word here and there. All right, let's do a, a few translation drills to reinforce the new conjugations and the question words you learned. All right, see if you can translate these. What do you want to do later? I want to go to the beach later. Ready? ¿Qué quieres hacer más tarde? Quiero ir a la playa más tarde. Did you get that one? Here's another one for you. Why do you have to work today? Because I have to eat. The verb for to eat is comer. Comer. See, now we just dropped in comer. I bet you can figure this one out. Ready? ¿Por qué tienes que trabajar hoy? ¿Por qué tengo que comer? Another sentence I bet you can translate now is this one because I want to be able to eat. So we have several verbs working there, but I bet you can do it. Ready? Porque quiero poder comer. Remember, we're only conjugating the first verb in a series of verbs, so we could just plugging in infinitive. That first verb is like the locomotive just pulling these cars. Two more sentences for you to translate before we move on. When can you study Spanish? I can study Spanish tomorrow. Now the verb for to study is estudiar. Estudiar. And I've never taught you how to say Spanish, but uh, you might have picked it up somewhere. Let's see if you can do those. All right. Ready? ¿Cuándo puedes estudiar español? ¿Cuándo puedes estudiar español? When can you study Spanish? ¿Puedo estudiar español mañana? 
Puedo estudiar español mañana. I can study Spanish tomorrow. Did you get those? You're just popping in some new vocab here and there, right? For the rest of the lesson, we're going to be working with the verb tener, to have, and I'm going to be showing you some really great phrases that you can kind of drop into your Spanish that use tener, and some really common uses of it that do not match English. You're going to like this. All right. The first phrase I want to teach you is tener tiempo para plus infinitive, and that is to have time to do something. And you don't have to use the para plus infinitive. You could just say to have time. Here's how we use it like uh, an example. ¿Quieres ir al centro? Do you want to go downtown? No. No tengo tiempo. No. I don't have time. Or you could say something like, Quiero ir. I want to go. Pero no tengo tiempo. But I don't have time. That's useful, but if you want to say what you don't have time for, then you're going to have to put the para plus infinitive verb. Which is to your advantage, right? Because you're just dropping in infinitives. Again, you don't have to conjugate. It's less thought. That's why I like this one. So let's look at the word para in this particular phrase. Para in Spanish has a lot of meanings. You're going to see it used in different uh, ways all through the language. I'm going to have a future lesson on it. But when you see para in front of a verb, translate it more like as in order to, to kind of keep it straight for you. To have time in order to do something. So take a look at this dialogue. Do you want to go downtown? ¿Quieres ir al centro? No. No tengo tiempo para ir al centro. No, I don't have time to go downtown. Go ahead and try to use this phrase with your cognate tricks and translate this sentence on your own. Do you have time to confirm the reservation? Ready? ¿Tienes tiempo para confirmar la reservación? ¿Tienes tiempo para confirmar la reservación? Now, you may be using reserva, depending on your country. You may have already gotten used to that. If that's the case, you probably came up with ¿Tienes tiempo para confirmar la reserva? All right, you think you're getting that construction down? Go ahead and translate these two sentences. Again, stop the video if you need to. And again, make sure you're saying these out loud, okay? Do you have time to study Spanish? Yes, I have time to study Spanish. Ready? ¿Tienes tiempo para estudiar español? Sí. Tengo tiempo para estudiar español. That's not too difficult, right? And I think the reason is that this construction just fits English well. So it makes sense to your English-speaking brain. All right, let's give you another construction that I really like. And this one is tener ganas de plus infinitive. And that is to feel like doing something. And again, don't try to break this down. Just learn it as a set phrase, okay? Here's some examples. Tengo ganas de ir a la playa. I feel like going to the beach. Tengo ganas de trabajar. I feel like working. So take a look at the English and the Spanish again. You'll see in the English, I'm using that progressive, the gerund, right? I feel like going, the ing. But in the Spanish, we're just plugging in an infinitive. This is another example of why word-for-word -word translations are generally not possible, and you should try to get away from that tendency, and instead learn vocabulary like in groups, plug-and-play phrases, things like that that you can pop together. And this is a set phrase, tener ganas de plus infinitive. See if you can translate these two sentences on your own. Do you feel like studying Spanish? No, I don't feel like studying Spanish today. Ready? ¿Tienes ganas de estudiar español? No. No tengo ganas de estudiar español hoy. Did you get those? I think you'll find those two phrases very useful. They pop in nicely in what you've already learned. Um, we're going to go on and talk more about tener. Uh, tener, to have, is used in a wide range of expressions in Spanish where we would actually use the verb to be in English. And that can get confusing for uh, new learners to the language. For example, um, to express age. In English, I would say, I'm 52 years old. But in Spanish, they would say, I have 52 years. So they're going to use tener. Tengo 52 años. Años. That is the N with a squiggly, also known as the Ñ. Años. You want to make sure that when you're saying your age, that you say años and not anos, because anos means anuses. And that sentence takes on a very different and disturbing translation at that point. As I mentioned before, 
I'm not going to dedicate a lesson to just teaching you numbers. You can learn those on your own. But I do suggest you learn at least your age. To ask someone how old they are in Spanish is, ¿Cuántos años tienes? And that's literally, how many years do you have? Whenever I see something like this in Spanish that doesn't match my English exactly, I find it helpful to actually remember these constructions literally translated in English. How many years do you have? I have so many years. That way, I remember to use them that way when I'm speaking Spanish in the future. Let's take a look at the word cuantos. That's a new question word for you, right? Uh, this one's a little different from the ones I showed you. The que, what, cuando, when, por qué, why. Because this one will change a little. It will have to agree in number and gender with the noun. Let's take a look at some examples. So if I have a singular masculine noun, it's going to become cuanto. Cuanto café tienes? How much coffee do you have? And if it's a singular feminine noun, it'll become cuanta. Cuánta fe tienes? How much faith do you have? And that's la fe, the faith. I don't expect you to learn these vocabulary words. They're just examples. And if you have a plural masculine noun, it becomes cuantos. And you already have an example of that. Cuántos años tienes? How many years do you have? Or in English, we would say, how old are you? And if we have a feminine plural noun, it becomes cuántas. Cuántas sillas tienes? How many chairs do you have? All right, let's get back to our expressions with tener. Tener is used to express if someone is hot or cold. In Spanish, they say, I have heat or I have cold. Calor and frío. These are nouns, not adjectives, so they don't have to agree in number and gender with the subject. It doesn't matter if the person's masculine or feminine. This is not going to change. So I could say something like, tengo calor. Literally, I have heat. But if we're translating English, we would say, I'm hot. If I want to ask somebody if they're hot, super easy to do. ¿Tienes calor? Are you hot? No. Tengo frío. No, I'm cold. But literally, do you have heat? No, I have cold. So this construction is just going to be used for living beings, not objects. For example, if I want to say the stove was hot, I wouldn't use this expression. I wouldn't say it has heat. I would say, la estufa está caliente. And if the drink was cold, I would say, la bebida está fría. In that sentence, it's fría and not frío because it's an adjective in that sentence. And adjectives in Spanish agree in number and gender with the nouns that they modify. And we're going to be recovering all of that in a future lesson. Don't worry. Right now, I just want you to learn that with living beings, we're going to say, I have heat or I have cold. All right? Let's go on to the next one. To be hungry or thirsty. That's what we say in English, but in Spanish, they're going to say, I have hunger, I have thirst. Hunger is hambre, thirst is sed. So here's your examples. Tengo hambre, I'm hungry. Tienes hambre? Are you hungry? No, tengo sed. No, I'm thirsty. There are a lot of other expressions with tener, but I really don't want to overwhelm you with all of them in one lesson. It's your turn to practice these constructions. I'm going to say the English, pause a moment, and then give you the Spanish. If you need to stop the video, because you want to write it out or something like that, feel free. And yes, you should be pronouncing these out loud, okay? Here we go. I'm hungry. Are you hungry? Tengo hambre. Tienes hambre? Tengo hambre. Tienes hambre? I'm thirsty. Are you thirsty? Tengo sed. Tienes sed? I'm hot. Are you hot? Tengo calor. Tienes calor? I'm cold. Are you cold? Tengo frío. Tienes frío? How old are you? I am blank years old. Go ahead and look up your age and fill it in. ¿Cuántos años tienes? Tengo blank años. I'm just going to assume that you got the number right because I don't have any way to verify that from here. Well, that's it for the lesson. I hope you enjoyed it. I would normally say hasta luego at this point, and that's see you later in Spanish. But I did promise those folks who were interested that I would explain why the tu form is much easier to use than the usted form, and hence why we started with that one. The first reason we went with the informal is that when conjugating the tu form, it is always clear from the conjugation that the verb belongs to tu which means that the word tu can always be left out of the sentence. Now, for beginning students, that makes it easier to work with because they won't have to decide 
where to stick the to in a sentence. For example, in questions, the subject often follows the verb. ¿Qué quieres tú? But by omitting to, that's one less thing you have to worry about. Unfortunately, we do not have that same luxury with usted. Usted shares the verb conjugation with the third person singular. So you have tengo, tienes, tiene, and that's where usted is. Usted and every other singular noun in existence. So we often have to stick the word usted somewhere in the sentence. But not too often, not in all the sentences, or we're going to start to sound redundant, but not too little either to make the other person we're talking to ask, who, who are you talking about right there? The second reason we went with the informal is that the indirect and direct object pronouns are much easier to use with the to form. In fact, there's only one word, te. That's it. Compare that to usted, where you may be using either le, lo, or la, depending on the gender of the person, and also what type of verb is being used. So that's a lot of decision making in there. Te, or le, lo, la, and deciding which one is the right one. And the third reason we're going with the two form is that in the simple past, known as the preterite, the two form is much easier for English speakers to pronounce. And there is no question who they were referring to. For example, let's say I want to translate this sentence. Did you speak with the manager? And I do it in the two form, I would ask, ¿Hablaste con el gerente? It's hablaste. It's easy to pronounce. It's very clear to the person who I'm talking to. Now let's compare that to usted. I could just ask, ¿Habló con el gerente? If it is known that I'm referring to usted, then I wouldn't have to put it in. Or maybe I already said usted another sentence, so I don't want to sound too redundant. Again, I'm having to think. Or I could throw it in there. ¿Habló usted con el gerente? Now look at that word, habló. It has an accent over the O. That's telling me to put the emphasis there. Now compare that to the first person present indicative. For example, I speak. Hablo. So it's a very subtle difference in pronunciation. Hablo. I speak. Hablo. Past tense, third person. Hablo. Hablo. What that means is that using that particular form in the past tense, the preterite, is going to require more precise pronunciation to use it correctly. That's all well and good down the road, but we're talking about beginners here. Beginners who are already likely struggling a bit to improve their Spanish pronunciation. Why make it more difficult? Those are the three main reasons why I teach the informal you first. And for the people who worry that someone will be offended by their use of tú instead of usted, Look, don't be. It will be very clear to the person you're speaking to that Spanish is not your first language. And also that you're pretty new at it. I know from experience that you will not be held to the same linguistic protocols that a native speaker would be. So don't worry about that. When you're at that level, communication is the most important thing. So as you get better at Spanish, you can start to work in usted, because it's also going to be clear to the person you're talking to that you have a better grasp of the language. And then, you know, you might be held to some of those standards. Well, that's it for today. And yes, this is actually the end of the video, for real this time. All right. Until next time, hasta luego.